George. Uh, welcome to another special episode for the Village Square podcast. Today, we have two awesome guests on the show today. John Purifoy is the co-founder and, can I call it, CEO of Floating Point Group. And Matthew Black is the co-founder and CEO of Atomic Finance. And I will now hand it over to you guys. John, uh, please give us an intro by yourself, if you can. Yeah, I would love to. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. It's great to meet you. Thank you so much, George, for being here. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I guess a little bit of background on myself. I grew up in the Midwest in Missouri. So if you've watched the show Ozarks, I'm actually from right around wow. the region, uh, which is kind of cool. I went to school up at MIT. I studied electrical engineering, computer science, and physics. I did a lot of work around data analytics and data prediction, applying those to different inverse problem solvings in physics. Um, so would love to talk about physics if you guys are interested, but that's totally okay if not. Uh, and then after that, I had a friend of mine that was into crypto. He convinced me to jump down the rabbit hole. I jumped in back in 2017, 2018, been operating in the space ever since. And so we at Floating Point Group, we're really about our core mission of you know building secure and efficient access to crypto. We do that both A, through execution and trading, helping people with agency OTC execution, really trying to help people be responsible in the market and find good ways to be able to transact. And on the other side, doing that with settlement systems, so enabling people to execute across exchanges with better operational security and less counterparty risk and things like that. So those are really the two main things that we've focused on. You know, we got a team here, a team over in Singapore, we're about 40 people now. Um, and yeah, and it's funny, we were talking about this before, and you know, like what makes a great day? And yeah, I'm fortunate. Most of my days are great days. Uh, and so, yeah, I kind of go for that. Matt, do you want to maybe take it on your side? And by the way, guys, Matt Black has the coolest name and background you will ever hear in your life. Appreciate that, John. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Matt. Matt Black. Uh, you know, my name's a color. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm one of the co-founders of Atomic Finance. And uh, I guess a little background on me. I'm actually from – I grew up in a small, small town, actually, uh, west coast of Canada, Vancouver Island. Uh, literally, uh, you know, to the age of five, I was on a Christmas tree farm, but, you know, but moved to a little, a little bigger town after that. Um, but, you know, back in the day, uh, you know, got into Bitcoin, actually, funny enough, uh, thanks to my dad. Um, you know, he's, he's one of these guys that, you know, really you know, doesn't trust the government, uh, likes to, you know, have his, his uh, you know, his capital in, in alternative currencies like, you know, gold, uh, silver. And so, you know, Bitcoin was something that was very, very interesting to him, um, you know, that was back in 2013, 2014. And then I spent, you know, honestly, I forgot about Bitcoin for a while, uh, got back into the space around 2017, and we started building a bunch of products in the, the DeFi space, um, you know, uh, got really interested in what was happening in DeFi lending um, and, you know, DeFi financial markets at the time. And, uh, and, and from there, actually, you know, uh, made a big transition from uh, being just really frustrated with what was happening with Ethereum DeFi and made a transition actually over to, to Bitcoin. And now we're actually focused on building DeFi entirely on Bitcoin uh, specifically. So uh, we, we're Atomic Finance and, you know, we allow for people to, you know, get access to, uh, to tools, financial tools on their Bitcoin uh, to allow for them to get out uh, access to yield without uh, actually having to give away custody of their Bitcoin. And uh, yeah, we're, we're really excited, uh, really excited to be here with both uh, uh, George, George and John today. So yeah, that's, that's what it for about for me. Wait, and if I could ask, did your dad, did he have like a bag of gold in the backyard or like, how did he go about it? <laughs> oh, well, he's got that. We're, we're always finding, you know, you go, you go to, you go to sit down at the TV and you find like, you know, little silver, silver coins down the, down the side. But <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I, I can't tell you where the gold, gold is, uh, you know, uh, it, it's hidden, but. Uh... <laughs> Wait, here's my stupid question. My understanding is that palladium has been like the exotic rare metal of like the past like 10 years. Are people buying palladium the same way they buy gold? Like, I don't know. Like, are people, like, storing palladium stocks? I, I, I couldn't tell you. I, 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 I have no idea. Like, he, he hasn't been into palladium. It's just been gold and silver. But maybe that's the new thing. Maybe we'll start doing it, you know? <laughs> Yeah, when I was in school, I think all my friends were, like, all about trading palladium. They were like, yo, man, palladium's going to go sky high. Uh, and I just thought it was, like, the coolest thing ever. That's so sick. So, okay, guys, okay, the, today's episode is going to be like a community round, like a panel, you know, we go all freestyle. Uh, let me kick off the topic today with a big news from CNBC today that the FTX group is purchasing BlockFi for $25 million, and it was valued at $14.1 billion, I believe, at its last valuation round. I could be wrong, but what is going on, guys? Uh, Matt, can I give it to you first? 
Well, well, we just saw, uh, I think Zach Prince had a, had a tweet, a uh, kind of response to saying, saying, saying was, that actually wasn't going to happen. So I don't know, I'd be surprised if it actually went that low. But I think it, it's, I don't know, it's, to me, it seems like this is, this is kind of a part of a larger conversation about, um, you know, larger firms in the space and kind of the risk that's being taken on. You know, we already saw Celsius essentially blow up and, you know, BlockFi is in trouble. Like, is this another, you know, 2008 for, for crypto? Like, what's, what's going on? And, and, and it's also like a question, I think, as well, about like how much leverage was there actually in the space, right? And how many people were, were gambling on these different tools? Like, if you go and I deposit my Bitcoin into, you know, um, you know a place that's, that's going to earn yield, am I ever going to see that back? Is it 8% yield on uh, 8% yield that I'll never enjoy on Bitcoin I'll, I'll never see again? Is that the question? I don't know. What are your thoughts, John? I think it's a good question. I think you're definitely right that people should be skeptical of high interest rates because, yeah, I mean, counterparty risk is a real thing. I think maybe the two interesting stats on this is like, one, uncollateralized lending was pretty common in the space, right? When you talk to most, so we worked like a lot of different hedge funds and quant groups, you talk to them and they would get like tens of millions to hundreds of millions at rates that were pretty low. Typically, uncollateralized rates went for about 5 to 15%, depending on the asset. Um, so I think the important comment here is that uncollateralized lending is definitely a scary prospect. It was way that a lot of these places were jacking up the interest rates. Unfortunately, a lot of that is now dead, right? Um, or fortunately, depending <laughs> right. on who you are. Uh, and so I think that like you've really seen in the past couple of weeks and you can go talk to funds about this, but like pretty much all uncollateralized lending is like dead right now. It'll probably have to come back because people have to justify the interest rates they're seeing. But I think as of right now, it's not. And so I think you're right that there was a lot of leverage in the space and it got exited out. So the specific question around BlockFi, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. BlockFi going for 25 million is definitely pretty low. Um, there was definitely some interesting things coming out of the Morgan Creek call that kind oh, okay. of leaked around it. Um, with Mark Yusko, like pretty crapping on FTX, like pretty hard and kind of, you know, the way they were going about the transaction. But I guess that makes sense. They were kind of competing against each other in those ways. Um, I think what's going to be interesting to see, though, is not what BlockFi does in this transition, but I think like where BlockFi is like two weeks or five weeks from now. And also, like, it's been interesting, right? Like Celsius and like Hodlnot and like other groups like Babel, like definitely encountered a lot of problems. Um, and liquidity problems. Interesting that it's now migrating to a little bit of what I would consider the better lenders that are cleaner sheets, like BlockFi's. Be interesting to see if this moves on to like larger groups next, right? And I think there's rumors speculating right now about some of these groups having like hundreds of millions wow. of defaults. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see if that kind of continues okay. to cascade. Well, I, I also find it quite interesting too that it's, um, you know, it's, it's kind of looking like BlockFi is essentially getting some type of, um, you know, bailout or buyout or, you know, it's essentially being, you know, saved to a certain extent, you know, thanks to some creditors, whereas a company like Celsius is not. And whether that's, you know, and, and so that's, it's, it's interesting to see that difference in paradigm. And if it's a situation where, um, you know, certain, you know, parties in the space are, you know, maybe worried about, you know, U.S. regulators, you know, in the case that BlockFi goes down versus if Celsius goes down, then it's, you know, not as, not as big of a concern. Um, so it's funny you mention that, and this is the part that I don't totally understand, is that both BlockFi and Celsius mainline product was offered to non-U.S. persons, right? It was mostly retail bearing accounts for non-U.S. retail. And so, yeah, I agree with you that I think, you know, regulators obviously don't want these things to fail, like different things like that. And so, you know, people in the space don't want that bad image. It'll be really interesting to understand, like, okay, is it really hitting the U.S. market? Is it really hitting international? Like, there's a really cool graph right now, right, which shows the amount of Bitcoin on Coinbase and Gemini versus the amount of Bitcoin sale on, like, offshore exchanges like Binance. And it's literally an inverse correlation. Like, Binance is accreted in assets. Coinbase is decreted. It's like fascinating, right? Like, isn't that really interesting that you are seeing this capital flight from the U.S. to like far more regulatory, like sketchy regimes? And I think in a lot of cases, it's because of reasons like you're commenting where people are like, OK, well, what are the regulators about to do if something like this happens? And I think that's yeah. really interesting. Maybe let's take, let's take a step back and talk about how BlockFi and those other companies are actually doing the lending by itself. So, Matt, can you give us a walkthrough about how lending has traditionally been done on the BlockFi's part? 
Uh, yeah, well, my understanding, and, and obviously it seems like it's fairly um, kind of the the routes that they're going for, you know, actually making capital is, is obviously uh, okay. proprietary. <laughs> um, but obviously the GPTC arm, I think, was like a major um, kind of you know, tool in their arsenal. Um, and so the idea was, my understanding of it anyway, was that, you know, GPTC essentially was um, – Trading at a at a premium, and so the uh, or uh, was it a, was it a premium or or or, or um, yeah, it was a premium. Yeah, so it was trading at a premium, and you know they they would essentially be just arbitrating G- GBDC. Um, I believe that they also you know perhaps had some you know lo- uh, loans on their books that they would then go uh, go and loan out to um, you know do uncollateralized loans to various lenders and hope that you know obviously they were paid back at the end. Um, and so obviously the hope for kind of these uh, retail folks is that they're putting their capital into BlockFi. BlockFi is managing all of the risk for them. Uh, they don't really know like where that capital is going at the end of the day, but they hope that BlockFi is able to kind of, um, you know, secure those assets and that they're lending to kind of trusted folks. And that at the end of the day, that Bitcoin will come back. But uh, one of the underlying things here is that there's no uh, kind of um, lenders of last resort, right? So if anything goes wrong with any of those lenders, that capital right. is not uh, and, and are there any collaterals involved, Matt? Or... Uh, um, I'm, I'm actually not too, not too sure. Uh, John, do you, have, do you have some thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, I have a couple of different... So to the specific question of is there collateral involved, um, so it depends, right? So BlockFi had a number of different lines of business and agreed, like part of this was collateralized lending, part of this was uncollateralized lending. I think the question there was just what interest rate and what activity were people using this for, right? I think like it, it's really important to understand that people use lending. Like the reason I'm an institution, the reason I'm going to go take money from BlockFi is solely for leverage, solely, right? It is for capital efficiency. It is, I am giving them 100 Bitcoin. They are giving me back USD. I'm taking that USD and I'm buying more Bitcoin and I'm levering up. And so when people talk about the space being levered, that's what they mean. Like lending equals leverage. Uh, I think the other use case of that is shorting, right? Obviously, where you're giving them USD, they're giving you back Bitcoin, you're selling the Bitcoin, and you're hoping the price will depreciate and give it back. But again, shorting in some ways, you're subject to very margin and volatility depending on kind of where the capital requirements go, right? Shorting can be literally an infinite lost trade. Um, and so I think that's where it's really scary is kind of understanding that. There's a really funny story that I think Matt was commenting on because Matt 100% agreed. Funny story that I was hearing earlier today. Don't know if it's true or false, but I think it's just a cool story. So in Brazil, actually, there was an ETF <laughs> of iShares. Um, actually, yeah, I, I apologize. I don't think it was exactly an ETF. It was more kind of a mutual okay. fund, index fund, et cetera. And it was a fund that was effectively just like holding a bag of assets of like different stocks. And it was trading and it traded at a discount because people didn't have faith in it, right? Because inherently these things always trade at a discount because there's management fees, liquidity concerns, counterparty concerns, et cetera. Fun fact is it always traded at a discount. Like an interesting question people always ask is like, is GBTC going to go back to parity? And what's funny is in this situation in Brazil, it's just kind of like a cool story. It always traded at a discount because of counterparty risk and other things like that. So people don't want to hold that. They want to hold the underlying until one guy came along, bought the whole thing and then dissolved it. And so he gave all the assets back to people and he made the 20 percent up. Uh, so there is an interesting point where if these things trade at too much of a premium, someone will literally buy these out because it's at a 50 percent discount. Take the underlying assets, distribute them, and they'll make a lot of money from it. Um, and so, but otherwise, yeah, I mean, like why the GBTC should never actually go back to parity. Um, there's no actual reason why that should happen, right? That, that was happening initially because of regulatory arbitrage, right? It was a lot easier to buy GBTC than buy Bitcoin. Now there's a lot of ways to buy Bitcoin. So it makes sense that that, like that discount is gone or that premium is gone. Well, and I think on the, on the, on the topic of like assets, um, going to parity or, uh, or I guess being um, traded at parity, I think another like interesting example was like um, STE, uh, the, the staking ETH, like where you had, I guess, I guess it was a situation where a bunch of funds made bets that essentially this asset um, would be able to, essentially like it was making yield on your Ethereum. And the idea was that you only were able to actually unlock the Ethereum from it once Ethereum went to POS. And so, I mean, we know what the, the history of Ethereum POS has been so far. And kind of what the progress has been and so the you know essentially to make that bet and hoping that you're going to get that capital back and then obviously it starts trading below um you know below ethereum spot um you know puts you in a really 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 tough spot um yeah 
there was a really good piece that I was reading about this that was like exactly the point that you're saying here, which is STE should never have traded at equal to E, right? Like, you know, like there's no reason, right? Like you're inherently taking both lockup risk of like, don't really know when the developers are finally going to get it done, right? Um, like, you know, people have been talking about proof of stake in the Ethereum ecosystem back since 2019, right? With some of the initial London I migrations. Um, and so it, it, it makes a lot of sense that this wouldn't trade because it's definitely more versatile. I think where Lido tried to argue that STE was useful was that it was more useful in uh, DeFi, was because actually more people were using DeFi in these situations, so therefore STE was, like, more, more powerful and potent. But, I mean... Yeah, I think you can like argue a lot of that because ultimately speaking, like ETH is a little bit like ETH just has actually fundamental value and ST ETH obviously is a note to own an ETH. Um, and so it's like more challenging on that side. But yeah, and, and I agree with you. I think ST ETH going to parity and like everything happened to three arrows and three arrows exposure to that is definitely interesting too, right? I, th I think the reality is just leverage in the space is brutal, right? It accelerates things in both directions. And a lot of people have been caught on the wrong sides of that. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually really unfortunate to have. Do you, I'm curious, John, do you think like um, the whole Terra Luna kind of situation, do you think that was a catalyst for kind of what, you know, I guess the, the shit show we've seen so far? You know, it's funny. I was reading this Twitter post this morning that someone was like, isn't it crazy that like, I think MicroStrategy or someone bought like 400 million worth of Bitcoin at like 60K or like 50K or something like that? I mean, might say that. No, I don't think so, because I think it was more just the macro environment turning negative, right? Like, like consider, con, con, consider like crypto for a minute, right? Like, why would I hold any other asset in the world when I have an asset that's clearly appreciating or giving me additional yield? Like, if I can go give my money to block by at a 7% interest rate and I'm getting it from a bank at like 0.5, why the heck would I not lever that up, right? If I'm any fund in the world, it just makes sense to do that. And if I'm any retail trader in the world, I want to make some money. And so why would I not do that? So in my opinion, what really has caused this is just the macroeconomic downturn causing those prices to move quickly. And I think those shops have a really hard problem. Like I remember a lot of calls that we had with different institutions and groups where they were like, hypothetically, let's say that we needed to sell like a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin just like really fast. How would we do that? Uh, right? And like you consider for a second, you're like, hey, that's a really scary question for a minute. That is a really scary question. Um, and so I think the reality is that a lot of people were playing, not necessarily picking pennies up in front of a steamroller, but I definitely don't think tail risk was properly modeled, right? Um, and, and let me be clear. I don't think anyone in this space properly models it. I, I, I don't think I really could go the extent of really shaming any of the firms that were kind of hit by really hard by this, because I think everyone in the space operates at a different level of risk. And I think that level of risk is risky. Um, and so in a lot of different ways. So no, I don't think it was necessarily Terra and Luna. I think Terra and Luna accelerated part of it just because, you know, the LFG dumped like tens of thousands of Bitcoin incredibly quickly. Um, and so I think that, that definitely exposed some of the volatility and brought it down for a bit. But I think you saw that stabilize afterward pretty okay. Um, I remember those days. Those were, that was a fun week. Uh, that, was a great, that was a very enjoyable week in the markets. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Matt, I'm curious for you, like, when you kind of think about the crypto space and you kind of think about like what might bring it back up or kind of what might bring it back, you think it's going to be stuff within the space? You think it's going to be macroeconomics or you think we're just going to like hold here for a while? Uh, I don't know. For me, I, I feel like in general, like we've seen, you know, like this is nothing new in Bitcoin. I, I, actually, actually, there is one element that is new. So in general, like you've, you've seen like a, you know, bull bear market like every four years. Now, the one thing that is a little bit different this time is typically in terms of trading cycles, you've seen that. Uh, Bitcoin in the bear market never goes below the previous all-time high, and that was broken this time. So right, like so, the trend is your friend until the trend ends. Well, the trend ended, and so uh, and so that's that's really interesting. This is uncharted territory for Bitcoin, but um, you know, in, in general, I think in crypto, like we all we always see these cycles every four years. You have the the halving that occurs with Bitcoin, and so you know, is it is it just a situation where right now, like yes, the the, the catalyst for this event was. Um, you know, maybe the macro environment, uh, you know, causing, you know, kind of prices, um, you know, I guess the cost of capital to, to go down significantly and, you know, just, you know, everyone was over levered and thought that the space was more mature than it was. Um, and really, you know, maybe in, four, in, you know, in three years, we're just going to see the same cycle kind of happen again. Maybe that's the case. Maybe it's not. Um, I, I find that in general, it's usually like, it's, it's usually a situation during bear markets that everyone just kind of forgets about, uh, you know, all, all, you know, 
maybe it's not like you know Bitcoin. Everyone really kind of dependent on these retail folks to kind of prop up the price, and that's what really created all of this volatility. And everybody forgets about that during the bear market. If you remember, I don't know if like you were probably around, John, like last time. Like you know, it, it just like flattened out. Like Bitcoin was a stable coin at six k for about like you know three months. And so you know, I think we're, everyone's going to forget about it for a while, and then there's going to be some catalyst that probably you know brings it back. But um, I don't know. What, like, what are your th- what are your thoughts on that, John? Do you think we're in for a longer bear market, a shorter bear market? No, I actually think the way you think about this is real. Like, I very much agree. Like, I think we have not seen pain yet. I think we will see pain when indifference sets in. When people are no longer excited about it, that's when it is. Like, isn't it really crazy that you literally will go and see ads for like, yo, easiest place to buy crypto, or are you getting in on this trend or whatever? And you're seeing that like all over the Twitterverse, and you're seeing that all over Facebook and Instagram. Like, these companies are just buying massive ad campaigns to do that. I think they're still getting people that necessarily haven't come into the space yet. There will be some degree of indifference. People will realize, oh, Bitcoin is just an asset like every other asset class. And you're going to see a lot of people walk away from the space because of that. So, yeah, I think you're right. And I think I think your point on the retail is actually really interesting because I've seen a couple of different arguments from a couple of different ways. And I, th- and, I, and I think it's just like interesting to hold these narratives in head, which is, okay, one is all these lending desks we just talked about. They're all pulling down their books, right? Like. Genesis had a massive lending book, which was a huge portion of the market. And same thing with like Celsius or BlockFi and other things like that. All those lending desks are pulling their books back because they don't want to be exposed to this risk. So you're having to see a lot of people liquidate, sell, get assets back, whatever, delever themselves. And that's kind of pulling the price down a lot. So you're seeing that. You're also seeing people just like need cash, right? They're like, they don't know what's going to happen. I just want to go to cash. That's it. So if you ask yourself, like, why is crypto not like rebounded? Why aren't people just being like, yo, 17,000, let me buy and get this thing back up. Then I think it's because there's so much pressure going down. So I think it's interesting because like there's these converting pressures, right? Which is like, one, people are delevering, people are getting out of the space. Institutions are taking capital where they can. And then you obviously have a lot of retail or new institutions in the space that are like, if I'm Goldman, why wouldn't I buy up these assets for $2, for $2 million, $2 billion, right? So I think you gotta have these like competing sides. Um, and yeah, I think it's going to be really, really, really interesting to understand, okay, which of those pressures is going to beat out. I think you're right. I think it's going to go back down. I think it's going to hover around a price for a while. I'm going to just make a market prediction because why not? Please bear in mind, this is not financial advice in any way, shape or form. I think 50, 10 to 15 is probably going to be the range. Um, and I think we're going to hit somewhere in there. And I think it's going to hold there until probably like beginning of next year. That's kind of in my mind where I'm pegging it. Because I think NASDAQ's also going to come down and S&P is going to come down about another 30, 40%. Um, cause you're still seeing highly inflated PE multiples and things. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I'd see it, but yeah, I, I agree with you on the same point. So. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I, well, and, and what you said specifically about like retail as well, like this concept of, you know, um, you know, back in, I just remember, you know, back in the day, you, you, you walked down the street, you didn't see signs about like, Oh, buy, buy crypto, buy Bitcoin, you know? Um, and, and we had this craze of like people just getting into NFTs as well. I mean, let's talk about that for a second, right? Like getting people getting into NFTs. What was that whole thing? You know, like everyone, uh, you know, uh, I, was it like naked apes? Like, I don't know. I don't know what it was called. Board apes. That's it. Like people just aping into this, like, you know, these different, uh, um, you know, these different NFTs that. Uh, oh, my naked you know, apes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be interesting. <laughs> No kidding. But, but you just like, you know, it's, it's really unfortunate to me because I think like, you know, the advertisements that are on the street are not for retail folks to come in here and, hey, buy Bitcoin, uh, buy, you know, uh, and, and hold it for the next 10 years. That's not the advertisement. The advertisement is get rich quick. And so, and so when that's the, when that's the, you know, kind of the incentive for folks to kind of get into the space and think about it, then you're, you're just going to run into a situation where all those folks that got in over the last two years, you know, year and a half, they're, you know, they're, they're gone and they're probably not coming back for another three or four years. Right. And, you know, everyone gets, you know, everyone gets uh, Bitcoin at the price they deserve. You know, um, the other thing I think is really interesting too, is like when the price fell, like when we saw March, 2020, um, and we saw like Black Thursday hit, you know, uh, you had a quick rebound. And, you know, in the back of everyone's mind, everyone's thinking, oh, you know, this is just like, you know, uh, March, March 2020, Black Thursday, and it's going to rebound right away. But, you know, if, if you look at the longer cycles, I think, I think you're right, John, that like we're going to see, you know, depressed levels that are going to go, you know, down into the, the tens. Uh, obviously, not financial advice once again. 
And if we see some more like um, kind of kind of major players fall, you know, it could go it could go even more. But uh, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's 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 hectic. Yeah. George, you got to get in on this. What are you thinking? Where's your price point? All right, cool. <laughs> well, we I mean, make some I'm bet. not really that into Web3, but, you know, I have been tracking Bitcoin for a while. I don't think it will go under $10,000. Um, that's just my personal belief. I think I think every, yeah, I think every, ten, every thousand or every 10,000 is actually like a hypothetical belief point, right? Like people believe that, okay, oh, we drop below 20,000. That means like an end of an era. And if it drops below you know, $10,000, that means it's an end of an era also, right? So I just don't think people who care about Bitcoin enough, who owns Bitcoin enough, it's going to allow it to drop below $10,000. And I think it's always going to stay about that. No. End of era was the same thing I titled the document after I <laughs> broke up with my first girlfriend. All right. Well, don't get me wrong. I'm down to the end of the new uh, era. All right. Wow, there was a document? <laughs> There was a document. It was well documented. Let me tell you, you think Bitcoin analysis is challenging the struggles of a teenage boy, all right? We go through it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th- I, I think you're definitely right on the end of era. And I think, Matt, great point on the three to four people. Dude, it's so you go and listen to commercials of, like, retail buying apps. They sound far more, far more like gambling places than actually investing places. Like, go listen to advertisements for, like, Robinhood or TD Ameritrade or Charles Schwab or things like that, they take a markedly different tone than you see for crypto places. And if you put the other axis there, which is like gambling sites, you know, like Caesar Sportsbook or like FanDuel or uh, there's like one that's really well known uh, or Barstool Sports, things like that. They are far more closer to that. And it's exactly right. Like everyone's gambling and they're trying to get rich quick. And it's actually really scary. Like it's really scary because it means that like, a funny thing that I think about is, right, like our business, right? Our business is working with institutions and we effectively either do trading for them, like effectively block trades, right? And we make commission on those trades or we build settlement systems where they can kind of connect to these different exchanges and do that. Okay, we charge them fees, right? We charge institutions fees. That's how I make my money at the end of the day. That's how I pay for, you know, people's on our team's college tuition mm-hmm. and things like that. Uh, but what's crazy about that is we're making money on fees off institutions, okay? That means institutions have to be making money. How are institutions making money? Institutions are making money because of appreciation of the assets, right? A lot of the groups we work with are like more longer term holders, right? Consider asset managers or investors, things like that. The reason I say that is like, why are those people making money? Those people are making money because all these assets are appreciated in value, right? Like it's because all these retail people are flocking in, buying and trying to get a part of the wave. So the reason why I say all this is one other thing, which you comment about this kind of V recovery, I do think one thing that is going to be pretty cool is I, I, I do actually buy that I think Bitcoin is going to come back stronger. And here's why is because like right now, the market, I think, has a total market capitalization like beneath a trillion. And what shock is like, I, don't, I think that's incorrect. I don't think it should be there. And so I think what's going to happen is I think you're going to see a lot of people start coming back in and just the amounts of capital they're going to bring is massive. And so I think you're going to see that value just skyrocket really fast. So, you know, I'm not saying buy today, uh, but I do believe that you're going to see that recovery really fast. Yeah, pl- plus one on that. Oh, I think, like, I think it's interesting because, um, you know, uh, I, it's always a question of, like, how, how bullish are you, right? And so how bullish are you on the time period that exists in the market today? Um, you know, like, when you're, buying, you're, when you're buying stats, when you're stacking stats, when you're buying Bitcoin, like, what should be the mental model that you're thinking of in the, in the back of my head? I mean, lots of Bitcoiners would tell you, like, buy coins as if they're going to be worth a million dollars one day, right? And so, and so, like, that's, you know, and, and don't think about it, like, what the price is today. Think of what it's going to be in 10 years, right? Um, you know, it takes, it takes time to build. And it's, it's unfortunate, too, that, like, more people aren't focused on, like, what's actually being built in the space. You know, everyone's focused, everyone's way too focused on what is the price? How can I get rich quick? Rather than, you know, like, I think a good example of this was, uh, you know, and a lot of it has to do with marketing. Like, if you remember back last year when Tesla announced that, um, you know, they were going to be accepting Bitcoin, like, all of a sudden, the, the, you know, the price shoots up. And then El, El Salvador announces that they're using Bitcoin as, um, as, uh, as, their, as their currency, as, as their, uh, you know, currency within their, their country. And, and the price, like, goes up, like, a tiny little bit. And so it's like, wow, like, what, what, what are people valuing here in adoption? And so it, it just means we're, we're really, really early still. We're in, like, the very early phases of, uh, of, crypt, you know, of crypto and Bitcoin, and there's, there's, there's a lot more to come. So Yeah, um, and to your point of mentality, dollar-cost averaging, in my opinion. I would dollar-cost average anything on this because, to me, I think that's the okay. 
I let's let's now talk that. more about, I mean, the altcoins, if we can. There are so many coins on the marketplace today, I mean, aside from Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the main, mainstream coins. What do you guys think of the altcoins? Like, are they just scams that are coming out to scam people? Or some of them actually have some use cases? Uh, John, do you want to go first? Uh, no, <laughs> but I will. Uh, sure. Um, altcoins. So I don't think you need 10,000 coins. I don't okay. think you can go with one. Um, so I think it's obviously going to be a okay. basket, maybe 20 to 30. I think what's really interesting, and a lot of people, it's funny, I literally I was here over here, part, people on our mm -hmm. team talk about like different coins today or whatever, uh, and like kind of like understand like, oh, like what's good about this one, what's good about this one. I, I, I think that's actually the right mentality. Like consider for a minute a couple different coins. Solana. I like Solana a lot. Solana's great. Solana's super fast, super awesome. Most of DeFi was built on Solana. Solana's not great for like reliability. Uh, like, i.e., Solana's gone down several times in the past, like, couple of months for pretty substantial periods of time. So if you're really wanting something, like, if you're a bank and you really can't ever have a payment go down, or, you know, you're like a government and you're relying upon this for some very vital infrastructure, it doesn't necessarily make sense to use Solana, because Solana's great, but it's got bugs. And it'll always have bugs, because that's how it's designed, and it's designed to move fast, and it's designed to sometimes make mistakes. So you contrast that with something like Bitcoin that's incredibly slow and meticulous, and I think it's a very different atmosphere. And you contrast that with, like, Ethereum, so I'm dating a girl, different girl in the end of the era, let's be clear. And my girlfriend is really amazing about the climate, and she works in the climate. She does incredible work in the climate, and she genuinely makes me a better person. I try to be more like her every day. And often the question she brings up is like, yo, Bitcoin, isn't that like killing the environment? Because, you know, 500 million, you know, a year and like electricity, isn't that terrible? And I'm like, you know, think for a minute. The reason Bitcoin is secure is because people are spending so much money mining it. The reason the dollar is secure is because some people are driving aircraft carriers <laughs> in circles around the ocean. And so the largest consumer of oil in the world is the U.S. military, right? The U.S. military single-handedly consumes the largest amount of oil in the world. And so I think it's important to understand that different currencies are going to have different values. Bitcoin is great, slow-moving, very consistent. It's backed by an incredible army of people that are just running it at it every day. Solana, a very different vibe. That's a very different vibe than, say, Algorand, which is really about, you know, low-carbon emissions and, like, trying to focus on being kind of, like, green and kind of cutting edge on that institutional, right? And that is a very different kind of flavor than something like, say, Filecoin, which is, like, trying to store things on a blockchain. So I think what I'm trying to say is, like, just I think different coins have different ethos, and they're designed to achieve those different things. I think that's good. I think that's the way the model should be. So I think it's going to come down, but I don't think it's ever going to go away. I don't know. Matt, what do you think? Yeah, I think um, this is probably where we, we differ a little bit, John. Like, obviously, oh, I, started right. my, <laughs> I, I started my journey, obviously, in the Ethereum space, building things in the, in the DeFi space. And I think um, it, was, it was through that process of actually um, kind of realizing what was being built there and, the, I guess, the challenges that I saw at the end of the day with um, a lot of altcoins that kind of led me uh, to Bitcoin and, obviously, the team I worked with at the time as well. But I think it's interesting because for us, like, our ethos has become, like, you know, we're building sound, uh, sound infrastructure for sound money, allowing for folks to be able to, you know, um, get access to non-custodial tools for their Bitcoin and, and make yield using that. Uh, but at the end of the day, like if I ask myself, what, you know, what is the coin that's going to be around in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years? Um, is it going to be, uh, is it going to be, you know, Solana? Is it going to be Avalanche? Is it going to be all these different altcoins? Or is it going to be Bitcoin, right? You know, if you look at the top 10 cryptos, um, you know, they've changed dramatically over the past 10 years. I mean, I used to remember when, uh, you know, uh, it, you know, Litecoin was second, you know, and then Ethereum popped up. And then I, mean, I, I will say that Ethereum has, you know, managed to stay kind of in their current position for a longer period of time. But it's um, for, for us, it was always about like, if we're if we're going to build something like let's build it on the chain that has the you know like all these other cryptos they're, they're not going to be around if bitcoin doesn't exist at the end of the day right and so why can't we take all of the innovation that's being built on these other coins and why can't we bring that over to bitcoin um you know you have the speed of you know trade execution that exists on solana but why can't we do that on lightning network for bitcoin um you have uh you know the smart contracts that exist on ethereum well we're building that with dlcs on bitcoin today right and so I think that it's going to be a process. Like it's, and and the, thing, the, the reality is it takes longer to build, build on Bitcoin. So we're not going to see these things tomorrow. But over time, it is my belief that, you know, all of these different innovations that exist in these other coins are eventually going to be transferred over to Bitcoin, whether it's natively on the chain itself using some, um, you know, type, type of, uh, you know, software, for example, um, or, you know, whether it exists on some type of side chain like Liquid, uh, where different, you know, kind of smart contracts can be built. So 
um, that's that's my kind of um, you know kind of view on uh, the, the the space. <laughs> All right, hold on. All right, we're going deeper on this. We're going deeper. Right. <laughs> I gotta see where this is at. All right, so I want so like first off, do you think that like the data at least to date is maybe going in the opposite direction of that? Like Bitcoin's dominance is like at like you know it's like not as high as it used to be, not nearly. And so, do you think that there's like more people in the space realizing that there are different use cases for different things? Well, it's interesting because the, I mean, the dominance that exists for 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 Bitcoin. I mean, it's, it's funny too because obviously the dominance increases massively during the bear market as well. And you know, if you just look at like coin market cap dominance today, uh, the majority of that dominance is due to a bunch of stable coins. Uh, they're sitting there on the sidelines, waiting to, uh, you know, waiting to kind of uh, you know go back into the market. Um, but, but yes, there, you know. Um, so your question is around like, do, uh, do I think that there's other use cases for different coins? Well, it's interesting because, um, and it's interesting you bring up Solana in particular because Bitcoiners have been saying for a long time that you know, kind of this idea of being able to get access to very fast execution of trades, you might as well just use a centralized database for that. Well, uh, I thought the Bitcoiners would probably say that Solana is essentially, you know, uh, to a certain extent, is a you know centralized database that you know it goes it goes down fairly often, and so it's it's very interesting to me looking at the. Solana like communities in particular, because there doesn't seem to be this view it's of, oh, like we don't need Bitcoin, you know, or um, we're going to, you know, there's going to be a flippening of Solana versus Bitcoin. It seems to be like, oh, Solana's for a very particular purpose and Bitcoin's for a very particular purpose. Whereas in Ethereum, I think you have more of a mindset of, um, you know, Ethereum can do everything. We're going to do, you know, everything possible and we're going to also flip Bitcoin. So we're going to be digital gold. Right. Okay. Well, it doesn't matter that Bitcoin exists for that. We're going to do smart contracts as well. And I think you you run into a situation where maybe um, maybe that's just not feasible. And and that at the end of the day, you 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 run into situations where you lose on some of the important elements that exist in Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin optimizes for decentralization and security, but it does not optimization for um, you know say scalability, for example, being able to do you know. Uh, 10,000 transactions, 100,000 transactions in a second. You can't do that, right? And that's that's okay. Um, you can go do that on a, on a centralized database, right? So on phys- I'm from a physics background. Um, and in physics, one of the coolest things ever was this concept of a Fermi pressure. And for those that took high school chemistry and high school physics, you'll recognize that Fermi pressure is effectively, if you've got a star and it's collapsing, like it's coming in on each other, the more that it collapses, the more gravity it has. So it will pull even harder. Right, so it'll just pull and pull and pull and keep pulling and keep pulling. So you might ask yourself, like, why does it become a black hole? Why does it become like a singularity? And it's because the more dense that it gets, it actually starts, and it's really cool. The atoms start occupying the same states. So it's actually the Pauli exclusion principle from chemistry, where two states can't be the exact same, two atoms can't be in the same state. It's actually the Pauli exclusion principle that starts creating an external pressure that pushes out to not enable it to all collapse. You have gravity increasing as it pushes in, Fermi pressure going up as it collapses deeper and deeper because they can't be in the same state. The reason I say this is I kind of sometimes use this as like an analogy for like companies. Like why can't there just be one company that takes over the world? Like why doesn't Facebook or Google or Amazon or whatever take over the world? And to me, there's this Fermi pressure where once you get a large beast or organization or entity, it just becomes a lot harder to have it serve all purposes, to have it just logistically work together, coordinate with each other in a very physical sense here, and other things. And to me, this question around Bitcoin and Bitcoin taking over the world, it's kind of like a Fermi pressure. Like, I have no doubt that Bitcoin would be great. I have no doubt Lightning Network would be good for many things. But I am going to doubt that, like, it's always going to be able to be what people need in that moment for that situation, right? There's, like, a reason that other startups exist and Google hasn't dominated us all. Like, there's a reason that I'm not working for, like, Apple right now, right, is that they haven't vomited and taken over the world. So I think there's different use cases for different things. I don't think all of it's transferable. And so I think in the chain world, I don't think everything can go down to Bitcoin. I, I, I have um, well, I think an underlying question for this is, is Bitcoin a company or is Bitcoin like a protocol? Like, for example, there's not many different internets, right? There's one internet that kind of everybody in the world uses. There's not a Microsoft internet and a Google one and yada, yada, yada. We kind of all converge together on a particular protocol that should be used as the standard for um, kind of transferring information over the web. And so, um, you know, is it is it possible that uh, the same you know analogy maybe should exist that there should be a standard for value transfer that's going to exist um, as well and a, and a particular protocol that gets used for that. 
I think it's a, it's a so it's a great question. Actually, I, you actually have a really interesting question. I haven't thought of it. I definitely think it's a business. Unquestionably, it is not a protocol. The reason why we're okay all using the internet, I've got no financial incentive to make a different internet. I've got a huge financial incentive to make a different Bitcoin, right? And so I think it's a hundred percent business. Yeah. So that's interesting too. Is that um, your point about like yes, there is a lot of incentive to create another yeah. Bitcoin because basically once everyone figured out that you know Bitcoin works. Then, then there's a lot of incentive to go create a new coin, um, and uh, and I, yeah, I mean, I mean that's that's the question, right? Is is um, you know kind of I mean there's there's obviously a morality question of that, but you know whatever you have to make money, but there's also a question of like um, you know if, if that's the case, you know Bitcoin's the only one where uh, in the beginning people didn't know it worked, and so and so you can make the argument that like you know the, the original inventor Satoshi did not know when he created Bitcoin that you know, is going to be discussed. Maybe you should buy some in case it takes off, you know? Um, whereas every, everything after that, there was kind of a, um, this idea of, 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 sorry, there's a financial incentive and there, everyone knew that, you know, there's an idea of printing money that existed there. And so, you know, that's always going to be an underlying element and kind of a, a thing that I guess corrupts like that underlying community. So what's really funny about this, and this is the most hilarious argument that I've heard on this, uh, first mover advantage often covers up crappy products. So, like, if I'm the first startup to a space, then I will have massive market share, even if I have the worst product in the world, right? Google is like the 17th search engine, for example, right? So it's a funny example because your example of Bitcoin actually, I think, hurts Bitcoin more because it suggests that Bitcoin is just here and it's just gotten that dominance because it was the first thing. It doesn't mean it's a good product. Actually, I think the other things that have started to get market share, despite all the financial, like, incentives, the cultish behavior and, like, other things like that, actually, I think they, therefore, have so much of a better product that they clearly went out. But I think you're right. Like, at the end of the day, it's actually a really interesting conversation. I don't know which one it goes to. Uh, but, I, yeah, 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 it's actually, it's actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say that Bitcoin is technically not the first because there were ones before like Bitcash and kind of all the other ones and all the other experiments that were kind of done. And I think what was learned from a lot of those experience, um, experiments, like if you uh, listen to like um, David uh, Toy, I think it was, and um, the, the kind of the Bcash experiment was that there was always an element in the other ones of some type of centralization that existed. It always relied on some party in order to make it work. And that was the one thing that was kind of solved in particular with Bitcoin. And Everything after that has kind of, you know, um, I guess made some uh, kind of adjust, adjustments to that decentralization as not that not being the most important principle. But the reality is that all these other altcoins may not, you know, probably wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Bitcoin at the end of the day. I think the thing that I will agree with you on to the end of the bank here, because, you know, maybe we disagree on the importance of Bitcoin versus other things. But I think the two points that I'd say about this is like the ethos that Bitcoin brought into the space and brought into the world, like entirety of humanity and society is I think this beautiful concept of like self-sovereignty, self-wealth, having control and independence and libertarianism, right? And I think that's very vital. And it's actually really sad to me to realize that I think, I think people accept that cryptos will percolate all of society. I think people know that like when you buy a house, the deed of that will be on the blockchain at some point. I think people know that like we're no longer, like for instance, the literal company ADP is the company that built the mainframe that the DTCC runs on that clears all stock transactions. Like that crap is written in like Cobalt and Fortran. And that's like every single stock transaction ever. So I think people accept that on the back end, you're gonna use cryptocurrencies and blockchain technologies in order for those back end technologies. I think what's a little bit sad about that narrative though, is if Bitcoin only ends up being used for that and not actually for the true values that you're talking about here. And when I think about how the space has changed in like the last 10 years, dude, go read Google about like Charlie Schrem or like the people that got Mt. Gox initially or some of the stuff. Like the space is so different today than where it was ago. And I'm really scared that in 10 years, it's even going to be more buttoned up. And I'm really nervous about what that future is because Bitcoin has the potential to make the world a lot better. Yeah, and speaking... and I really want that. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, right? Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, speaking... Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I, I was just gonna say. <laughs> I was just gonna say really quickly. Like, uh, I think you you brought up a great point about Bitcoin. Like, if Bitcoin doesn't actually do anything, if it just ends up as Bitcoin or it just ends up as gold, like, what's the point, right? Um, if it if it's not actually used for anything exciting, if it just ends up being put in, you know, uh, uh, you know, just ends up just in the same way that gold ended up in a bunch of like custodians and a bunch of banks and. Um, you know, at the end of the day, like that's, that's not what it was here for. Oh um, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> oh, I was gonna, I was just gonna step in like, because John mentioned about the future of blockchain. Right. And I just thought about, you know, there's as, as this FTX that's been making some news lately. It's just rumor that it's going to buy Robinhood and it just bought BlockFi and it just bought a, not a, a few other FinTech startups. So what is going on here? And is this going to be the future for web three? Is it going to be more consolidation around, uh, Matt, do you want to go first? 
So the question is, what is the future of Web3 or like what is the future of, I guess, Bitcoin, crypto and Web3? Um, I guess I, I probably have a view of like what I hope it's going to be uh, and, and maybe like maybe a more pessimistic view. Um, like I, I would hope that it's a future where, you know, there's a focus on, on building, you know, great products that actually solve problems in the, in the world and, um, you know, allow for people to take back their self-sovereignty that we move away from a system where we're um, reliant on, uh, extremely reliant on governments and the feds to determine, you know, what kind of happens in our daily lives that we move towards a future where, um, you know, people are able to build, build wealth for generations. I hope that's the future we move towards and, and that we can uh, build more tools that allow for like the financial products that we use every day to not like, you know, uh, have so much inherited risk that exists. You know, if I deposit my money into an exchange or, um, you know, into Celsius, like, am I going to get my Bitcoin back and rather be focused on tools that I'm able to make yield while ho holding onto the keys myself? I'm hoping that that's the future that we, that we push for. Um, the pessimistic view would be that the future of Bitcoin and crypto is, is simply, um, you know, a reincarnation of gold where, um, you know, uh, kind of, you know, governments around the world kind of eat up all the, all the, all the cryptos and gold around the world and that they keep it in, 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 in kind of their vaults and that um, you just get paid for Bitcoin and you have the same problem of fiat that, 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 that gets recreated again. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of my view on the two. What, what are your thoughts, uh, John, on the, on the future of uh, crypto and Bitcoin? I was like kind of going back and forth while you were talking. You made some really good points. And I was like, crap, this is right around. I get it. Uh, uh, you have a really hard question, George. Um, I don't know. I'll try to say just words. Um, ICBMs, nuclear missiles, and aircraft carriers, like pretty strong things. Like it's really hard to disagree with someone <laughs> when they've got a nuclear yeah. weapon. And so I don't think I think crypto is going to have to be pretty subtle in the ways that it influences society. Like for instance, right? I went to the Crypto Bahamas conference a while ago, and it was down in the Bahamas, um, as Crypto Bahamas would suggest. Uh, and it was really interesting that the conference was there, not like in New York and the United States. Why is that? Because, well, the company you're talking about, like FDI, is like, they're based in the Bahamas. Why? Because the regulation is more loose and they can do more things down there. So I think to me, I don't think Bitcoin can come out and just be like, yo, we're not going to do AML or KYC and like go for this and, you know, freedom and stuff. I think it's going to have to find really subtle ways to really percolate and penetrate and improve and change society. Like, I kind of think about it, and I apologize for this analogy for anyone using Bitcoin because maybe it's a bad one, but there's, there's, when you think about military and you think about power, there are things that centralize power, there are things that decentralize power. For instance, a tank, really hard to build, really easy to identify if someone has a tank. So tank doesn't really help decentralize power, kind of puts it in the hands of the government. AK-47, on the other hand, super decentralizer, right? Like, you can build that weapon, ship it anywhere in the world, dip 50,000 of those to the civilians, they can uprise and take over most of the government, Right. So I think the way that I think about this is like, is Bitcoin a centralizing technology or decentralizing technology? Matt, I think you have a really great point about like, if it goes and just governments hoard it and just put it in vaults, then that'll be a really sad outcome of this. Um, I think in some ways, it's definitely always going to have changed society for the better. The fact that if I'm stuck in Vietnam and I can put my wealth in Bitcoin and come out with that, I think is at least a positive thing. But the idea that like, you know, Ukrainian exchanges or the U.S., like, you know, the fact that the, like, like the travel rule, right, in Denmark, right, is like crazy, right? Like literally exchanges now in parts of Europe have to, when you send Bitcoin, you have to put down the address and the name of the recipient of what you're sending the Bitcoin to. That is crazy. That cuts at the heart of what crypto is. So I don't know. I think it's really hard to argue with an ICBM and a nuclear weapon and an aircraft carrier. And so I'm pretty pessimistic on a lot of parts of this. I think crypto is going to have to do a lot of soul searching to find ways to influence society and really change the world. Um, without just being going up front, because I think if they go up front, they're going to lose every time, um, as they have in the past. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I guess it's also it's interesting to me too, because it's also a question of like, what what um, what what, uh, what future occurs first, like with like society? You know, are we moving towards a society that it where you have uh, you know digital ID passports and CBDCs and um, or are we moving towards more of a freedom society where, you know, people are free to do as they want. They have the privacy that they're deserved. They have the self-sovereignty that they're deserved. Like, um, 
in a country where maybe you know it's very centrally controlled, um, perhaps you have a situation where you know that control also um, emits the Bitcoin. But at the end of the day, as you said, John, like if I'm in if I'm in Venezuela or wherever in the world, like I can escape with my entire wealth in like twelve words. And I think that's that's the most that's that's such a powerful thing um, that is that has really really been so revolutionary for 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 humanity. I think. I heard the cool story the other day about people buying Bitcoin miners just so they could get the Bitcoin because it's pure Bitcoin that hasn't been touched. I think that's the coolest story I've ever heard. Yeah, yeah. But Virgin coins, eh? <laughs> yeah. Dude, back in the OTC madness, back in like 27, 2018, yo, yo, I got this guy who wants to buy $2 billion of Bitcoin. You got some proof of coin? And then people had to come up with proof of proof of coin because people were faking the proof of coin. That's great. Great. It's 10 out of 10. Have you guys, I'm curious for you guys, John. Have you have you seen folks come in like, uh, like literally asking for like Virgin coins in particular? Like I heard there's actually a premium on it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you hear that a lot, and you hear the I'd rather not go through <laughs> AML and KYC. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You hear that sometimes, and you're like, I don't think I can help you here. Uh, and you hear a lot of I've got a friend. All right, he's just needing to do this deal, but. Just, just can't tell him who he is. And it's just like, okay, all right, got it. But um, it's like, it's like fascinating to me because, like, okay, yeah, obviously that's it's interesting. It's like, obviously, I mean, obviously, you guys can't help them, and you can't like work with them because obviously that those are requirements for you guys. But yeah, it just looked like you know, hundred years ago. Um, are you guys familiar with like Bill like six, sixty one zero two? You're probably familiar with it, John. Uh, I'm not familiar with that one, but is that the one where banks couldn't just take in bags of money? No, it was um, it was where the government like kind of uh, ordered all citizens of the United States and like took the gold basically. Um, like it wasn't that long ago that that happened, you know. Like the government came in and and you know if you're the gold, they took your they took your gold. And so is it that far fetched for something like this to occur again with Bitcoin? Well, it's still it's going to be a lot harder still because you know you have to find the you have to find the seed words and find where they're stored. But you know it's. It's like, you know, maybe there, maybe there's a, there's a thought process behind that. You know? you know, you know, what's good. I think this is a problem for Congress. All right. Congress, incredibly slow, really doesn't make many decisions. It doesn't really do much. <laughs> I like Congress solving this problem. Let me tell you what, this is Congress. Kind yeah, of that's problem. awesome. Yeah. So it looks like we're almost out of time. So oh, wow, it's been an awesome discussion, but let's have some closing thoughts. What do you guys think at the end of 2022, where will we be in the Web3 world? Matt, let's go first. Uh, 2022, uh, it's probably still going to be probably still going to be a bear market. Uh, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's we're either going to have a shorter bear market or it's or it's going to last until 2022. I think we're going to see some exciting things being built. In the meantime, some more uh, for, for in my in my space, it's going to be you know more uh, what we call smart contracts of Bitcoin or DLCs, more kind of products being built around that that allows for folks to get access to that. Um, I think there's going to be, you know, a larger adoption of Lightning Network that's going to increase. We're already seeing like uh, ridiculous numbers that uh, is occurring there. And so and I think there's going to be a lot of building going on. You know, the bear market is the perfect time to build. And if you build now, then you're uh, and, you know, you can launch now, uh, then, you know, you're good to go for the for the bull market. So that, that's yeah, what John, I'm seeing what about you? six months. Yeah. How are you, John? Yeah, I go 14K Bitcoin. I go, I think the US will release another report on a CBDC. I don't think they're going to actually release it, but we'll see. I think you'll probably see retail advertisement reduced, both from a regulatory sense and just from a commercial sense. Um, and I think you'll see sentiment still pretty bad in the space. Um, I'm, I, I don't think I'm too optimistic. Although it's funny, did you know today <laughs> is actually midway through the year? So it's really funny that we started this year and our stories were totally different. And I'm sure by the end of the year, they're going to be totally different. So I'm sure we're going to be wrong and yeah, you know, we'll probably neglect yeah, everything and, we said. This has been an incredibly exciting episode, guys. Like, I think this is like one of the best episodes. I mean, the, the best episode that I've ever done. So <laughs> thank you so thank you guys so much for like doing this uh, <laughs> format. Like we never have three people on the show talking to each other. I think that's like so great. Non-scripted. Everything's just in the flow. So thank you guys so much, Matt and John. Yeah. Talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, George. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, guys. Okay. Awesome. We're just pausing. I got to.